I don't know if you're like me, but uh, do you look forward to the postman coming? And, uh, and when he doesn't come, you go, no, he didn't come today. Nobody loves me, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and, and when you get the post and you look at it on the, the mat, um, you quite quickly know which of the bills, what's from your bank and all that. And um, you look out, don't you, for perhaps an, an odd one, an odd letter that might be in a little white envelope or a brown envelope, but particularly if it's handwritten. And, and I always, and perhaps you do too, you, you go to that one first, don't you? <laughs> because you think it's going to be more important than the others or more precious. And, and it's lovely, isn't it, to receive, perhaps we don't do that so much nowadays, to receive something that's handwritten from someone else. And, and I was um, sorting out my loft, uh, well, I've been sorting out my loft for years, it seems. Uh, and I was sorting out my loft recently, and I come across some cards which people had handwritten uh, for me. There's the one with a little spider. That's supposed to be me, by the way. Uh, and there's a cross and, and that from a lady called Jackie. I've no idea who Jackie is, but God bless her, wherever she is. Um, and there was a one from, uh, with some African children on, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a leaf which somebody painted and there was another one which was handwritten by a friend of mine as you see the writing there and on the front it says um, we cannot direct the wind but we can adjust the sails ooh deep yeah got any sailors here yeah anybody got a boat no nobody got a boat <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> Anyway, we get the idea, don't we? But I wanted to just comment this one. Uh, a lady called Sylvia Butler, and she's 93 now, and she lives in Scotland. And um, she just wrote, well, this is, this is years ago. And uh, what she used to do to me, uh, she was a very tall lady, and uh, she used to wag her finger at me like that, see? And as she was tall, she had a long finger as well. <laughs> And, and she refers to this in, in this uh, note. She says, I'm writing this because uh, in holding the pen, I cannot wag my finger at you, see? <laughs> and she was only doing that because, uh, uh, well, once in the, in the, on the Sunday service, I said, I'll just quickly read a few verses of scripture. And in front of everyone, she said, we shouldn't read the scripture quickly, like that, you see? Um, <laughs> But I, I did appreciate her, and I, and, I, and I still do. But um, I just wanted to look at three occasions in the Bible where God writes to his people, uh, or writes to mankind, really. And we know the whole Bible is God's writing to us, but there are three specific stories or accounts uh, where God wrote uh, because he wanted to express his heart uh, for who he was um, writing to. Uh, and the first one, uh, you'll know this one, I expect, uh, but in Exodus 32, so if you want to turn to Exodus 32, we can't go into the passages too deeply because of time, but Exodus 32 and verse 16, it says the tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So this is the first instance where God specifically writes uh, to his people. And he's expressing his heart to a people that he loves. Um, we would call it, uh, the Bible calls it the, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words or the Ten Sayings. Um, unfortunately, when we've thought about the Ten Commandments over the years, we've thought, what, what's the word that comes to your mind when you think of the Ten Commandments? You think of the word... Shout it out. Nobody thinks of anything. OK, I'll help you out. But we call it the law, don't we? We say, oh, the law, the law. And I think the Ten Commandments have had a bit of a bad press over the years because we see them as something that's restrictive. God's a bit of a killjoy. You can't do this, and you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and actually, when we understand God's heart for us, he wouldn't put 
which is a structure in place in order to help us to live properly, he wouldn't do that and put us in prison at the same time. And the Ten Commandments are there to liberate us, not to restrict us. They're there to, to teach us how to live correctly. And so when you look at the word Torah in the Hebrew, it doesn't just mean law, it means direction, it means wisdom, it means counsel. It's a lot bigger than what we initially think it means. And uh, even at the heart of the root of the word Sabbath is not just rest. I mean, God didn't need a rest anyway, did he? He just rested from creating. He wasn't tired, okay? But the, jo- the, the root of the, of the word means to celebrate and to be joyful. So when you think of the Sabbath, if you think of the Sabbath, the root of that is to rejoice and to worship. And if we just say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that, we miss the point of God's heart, of God's letter, his love letter to us, because he wants us to have freedom. And uh, just as a cross-reference in uh, Deuteronomy 12, 28, talking about obey my commands, so that it will go well with you. And that's God's heart, isn't it? If we obey what he says, then we can expect really... Not necessarily easy times, but whether whether they're easy or they're hard, it matters not, because we know God's hand and God's favour on our life, don't we? So the circumstances don't dictate. It's our relationship, what we believe in the Lord, that dictates. And when you follow the rules, when you follow God's heart, if you want to put it that way, then we can expect some amazing things to happen in our lives. Um, I became a Christian at 16, and you probably would have forgotten, but I, I read you at one point in my visit a while back, I read you my school report. I don't know if you remember that, but you, you might have done. And it was all like useless and, you know, he's never there and give up and, and all this sort of thing. Um, well, that's before I became a Christian. And when I was looking through in the loft, I found my secondary school report, which I knew was somewhere, but I, you know, I just discovered it. And this is when I'd become a Christian. And these are some of the things that were written to me, about me. The change in attitude this year is almost unbelievable. <laughs> what a lovely thing for the, for the teacher to say. And French, his application to study this year has been excellent. And I see Jesus all through this, I really do. <clears throat> Humanities. <clears throat> He's followed a course of study... Alan tends to support a minority opinion. That's because I love Jesus and I couldn't shut up. <laughs> uh, German, I always found German difficult, uh, and, um, and my German teacher, I've frustrated over the years, I've never known a boy work harder <laughs> for an O-level exam. And it, and it just went on and on and on. And there was a transformation because Jesus was causing that transformation in my life because for the first time in 16 years, I was following the rules. I was studying. I was giving it a little bit of this and a little bit of that and I wasn't just playing football all the time. So if we adjust the way we live, if we adjust our attitude, if we adjust the things that we do, Sometimes it's a fine tune, it's not an engine overhaul all the time. If we make the adjustment through God's grace, then I believe, and I do believe, God will work in our hearts for good and we will see a transformation. And I don't believe there's anyone here today who wouldn't like to be transformed just that little bit more like Jesus. That's what we're about, isn't it? So that is God's word through um, Exodus 32. Now, just go back to Exodus 32. What's going on to set a bit of a scene here? Uh, you know what's happening. The golden calf, you've probably got a little title uh, at the top of the chapter. And interestingly enough, as you know, they, they make a golden calf because Moses has gone away and he's not come back quick enough in, in the people's minds. And uh, so they made a golden calf. And then in verse 5, says something really interesting. When Aaron saw this, 
about the calf and the fashioning it and the gold and everything and the worship, idolatry, he built an altar in front of the calf. Can you see that? He built an altar, which is quite significant, it's an expression of worship, in front of the calf. So he wanted to hide the calf behind the altar. As if God, God couldn't see the calf. So we'll put an altar. We'll make it respectable. We'll make it look good, effectively. So the idol's still there, but as a front, we'll put an altar. And I think that's what we do sometimes. We, we, we look respectable, we smile in the right places, we sing the right songs and we do the right thing. But actually, what's going on inside? And God's heart, God's message... God's letter uh, for you and for me this morning uh, is that let's just align ourselves with what his message says to us. And in doing that, we will see change. We'll not only see change in our lives, but in other people's lives. Because as we know, our society is in a mess and it's getting worse. I can't see it, see it getting better. And you get people arrested, don't you, for standing outside an abortion clinic and praying silently arrested twice. And I read recently that people are being told now not to call your daughters pretty because it enhances their femininity. Of course, we don't want that, do we? Yeah, we don't admit someone's a male or a female. Of course we don't. That's the world we live in. So don't call anyone pretty. That's the sort of thing that's creeping in. And there is a sense in which we've got to stand up for that. And interestingly enough, as we know, the law was written on tablets of stone, which is very, very rigid. And I believe God will not compromise, but he will make allowances. Aren't we glad about that? He won't change his word to suit us. We have to change to suit the word. It's the other way round. But in our sin and in our weakness, God makes allowances. And if he didn't, none of us will be here. So that's the first little communication, the first little message uh, that God sends us. And it's one that's written by the hand of God. So the first one's of God. The second one is, uh, does anyone know what the second one might be? If you know your Bibles, you might know. If you don't know your Bibles, you might know, you can guess. The writing on the wall. And that is in the book of Daniel. Yeah, well done. So if you want to turn to Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, it's really interesting. How many times have you heard a sermon about the writing on the wall? Um, when we were kids, we used to write on walls, didn't we? And uh, sometimes you couldn't wash it off. <laughs> but Daniel chapter 5, it's, it's called the writing on the wall. And in verse 5, it says, Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall, near the lampstand in the royal palace. So to get it into context, you've got Nebuchadnezzar, who was, who was a big head. Uh, you know, this is a great Babylon that I have, uh, you know, built. And then his son, uh, Belshazzar, was not much uh, better. Uh, and there was an arrogance about Belshazzar. And if you look at verse, uh, verses 24 to 28... Verses 24 to 28. This is the message. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. Now, this is a message that's written by human hand. That's what it says. So the first one was written by God. The second one was written by a human hand. All right, the Hebrew says a man. And this is the inscription. Mene, mene, tekel, ufazin. And you can see the description and the translation there. A couple of interesting things about this particular message. Uh, it, it, it was written on plaster. Now, plaster, I'm no plasterer. Got any plasterers here? Somebody can plaster? Builders? No, nobody can plaster either. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we know plasterers, don't we? And, and certainly when I was a kid, uh, one of the things I used to do is I used to lay in my bed at night and I used to pick the plaster with my finger and keep picking it and... and, and, and in the end, I had a great big hole. And I put a Man United poster over it, because I was me, you know, me. Uh, put a poster over it to hide it from my dad. 
and, uh, and I went right through the lath and plaster, or went to the lath, you know, the lathe, the, the wooden bits. So it was massive, and I was really proud of the hole, you know, because I, I dug it, you know. But when my, when my dad found out, he went berserk, absolute berserk. Uh, and the fact is that plaster is here, it's a symbol of um, weakness, symbol of humility. It's a symbol of, because it's not hard and rigid like stone, is it? And that's the point about the message being on plaster, is we can quite easily destroy it. We can quite easily eradicate it. Um, and that's sometimes what we do. Have you ever known, you don't have to put your hand up or anything, have you ever known God speaking to you specifically and you've sort of sat on it and you haven't done anything about it? You ever known that? Uh, we haven't acted upon it. Okay? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and that's the, that's the characteristic of plaster. It's, it's not forever. It's not rigid. It's not going to last if you like, time, uh, and it's very easily destroyed uh, by people and very easy, easily destroyed by us. There's an erosion that's going on with plaster that wouldn't be going on uh, with stone. And uh, this other uh, aspect is that, if you look at verse 5, it's written on plaster by the lampstand. And the lampstand is going to give us what? It's going to give us, it's going to give us light, obviously, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but um, at my extremely advanced age, um, I have to wear glasses, contact lenses, readers. Uh, occasionally, I'll wear a telescope. And, no, not really, but <laughs> binoculars, all that sort of thing. And as you get older... Your, your muscles in your eyes start to weaken and your pupil gets smaller and, and it doesn't let in as much light. You young ones won't know all about this because everything's working, isn't it? But as you get older, bits start to drop off and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and your eyes, you need more light, don't you? So you're like forever doing that. Where's the light and all this sort of thing? And, and the light is really, really... Important. We know that, don't we, in the Bible? Jesus being the light and all that sort of thing. And John 1, what does it say? The darkness cannot and does not overcome the light. Aren't we glad about that? That's not just something to read at Christmas, is it? As Rachel said, it's all through the year. Christmas is all through the year. Easter is all through the year, really, isn't it? Harvest is all through the year. It's wonderful, eternal truth. So we need... The light, and that's why this is by the lampstand, uh, because the light and the word go together. In Victorian times, they used to have something called link boys. Ever heard of link boys? Uh, and when you went out in Victorian times, these link boys went in front of you in the dark with a stick uh, and and some sort of uh, light on the end of the stick, a flame, uh, and they they were paid to help you to show you your way. Well, when the gas lights came, uh, the link boys went out of fashion, and the lamp lighters came in. Yeah, I've got a few nods there. Of course, you weren't around at the time. I know you weren't. <laughs> but it's lamp lighters, and their job was, was to light the lamp in the morning and to turn the lamp off at night. <clears throat> that was their job. They were called lamp lighters. So people who had the responsibility of helping others to see in the dark. Can you see the spiritual connection there? I'm sure you can. We're all spiritual lamplighters. We should be, shouldn't we? Where God has given you and me the task of bringing his message to the people that we know and love, strangers, whoever. It's the whosoever. And God causes you and me to be a light that actually in Leviticus it says this light in the temple must never go out. And I've met a lot of Christians, um, perhaps you have, perhaps you're one of them, and particularly since COVID, I've known a lot of Christians have got really lazy. Have you, have you felt that? You know, a lot of them don't come to church anymore because during COVID they were sitting there with their cup of coffee in their pyjamas, weren't they? So this is great, slippers, you know, and all that. 
And some of them are still doing that. Um, and God bless you if you're on live stream. I'm not suggesting you sit there in your pyjamas uh, and your slippers, but uh, we need fellowship, don't we? We need to get together face to face, iron sharpening iron. You can't do that through a machine. Um, so we are called to be light. And you know that lady in Proverbs 31, do you remember her? Uh, the noble woman. Uh, and every time you say that, women go, oh, I feel all inferior now. Well, this is a lesson for men as well. It's not, you know, it's not a gender thing, is it? It's God's truth coming through. And the lovely thing about this woman, Proverbs 31, if you're making notes, is in verse 15, it says, she gets up while it's still dark. I love that. She works in the dark. She's got a light, but while others are asleep, she's awake. And I think that's a lovely thing, really, actually. Um, and I get up really early in the morning, and I, I love it when it's dark outside before the dawn. And I think, thank you, Lord, that I'm doing stuff when other people are asleep. It's lovely, uh, using the time. So if you're that sort of person, rejoice and give thanks to God that God enables you and gives you the grace to work at night. That was this woman in verse 15 of Proverbs 31. And verse 18, it says, Her lamp does not go out. So I wonder how you're getting on. I wonder if your lamp's struggling. I wonder if the light is just a little flicker, whereas it used to be a flame. Only you will know that. Do you remember that Graham Kendrick song years and years ago? Uh, turn our heart into a flame. You, I, I don't know if it was a let the flame burn bright or something, it might have been. Where God turns the heart into a flame, the flicker into a flame. And only you know whether your light is going out, has gone out, um, or whether it needs to be brighter. And that's God's message from Daniel. Actually, it wasn't good news, was it? Because Belshazzar that night, he actually died. So some of the things God says are quite severe, but it's always said out of love and concern because he wants us to live within the structure that we've mentioned already. And so many people in our society are making wrong choices, aren't they? Sometimes we make wrong choices. Choosing the dark instead of the light. Greed is something that's... I just see greed everywhere on the increase, you know? Uh, and we could go into that, but... It's a choice, and Deuteronomy 30 says, choose, what does it say? Choose life. Deuteronomy 30, choose life. And when I was preparing this, uh, I, I thought of that old Sunday school song. Uh, I don't know if ever you were in Sunday school. I was only in Sunday school for about six weeks. I couldn't put up with them, and they couldn't put up with me. But, um, and there was a song years ago, it was, um, I'll sing it to you. I met Jesus at the crossroads Where the two ways meet Satan, he was standing there And he said, come this way Lots and lots of treasures I have got for you today But I said, no, there's Jesus here Come see what he offers me Down here my sin's forgiven up there, a home in heaven. Praise God, that's the way for me. Did everyone know that? Yeah. <laughs> but that's the way, isn't it? It's a little simple Sunday school song. But what truth there is in that? Making the right choices. And that's why God writes to us in the way that he does. So the first message was written by God. The second message was written by man. And the third message was written by a God-man. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus. So you know where that is, don't you? Where is that going to be? That's in... What's the third writing? writing hmm? Writing yeah, and that's in John 8. Okay, well, we're very familiar with the story, aren't we? The adulterous uh, woman. Uh, and it's a message. We, we don't actually know what the message was, do we? Uh, that's actually not the most important thing. And there's a couple of things about this. In John 7, 37, it says about on the last and greatest day of the feast. That's John 7, 37. And then in chapter 8, it says about at dawn. So that's the next day. 
And the first day after a Jewish feast was regarded as a Sabbath, where you couldn't do anything creative. In fact, you couldn't even write, because that's creating something new. But Jesus knew that you could write on the ground, because it wasn't permanent. Okay, so he knew that, because obviously I believe he knew everything. So that was the first thing. Jesus is writing, and he is writing with the finger of God. And the people around him, the Pharisees, all the religious people, they would have automatically thought about the past. They would have thought about the law. They would have thought about Daniel because they were very, very well-versed since their childhood. And Jesus' writing on the ground is a sign of of his messiahship. He is saying, I am God, as he's writing on the ground. That's the important thing. It's a messianic proclamation. And you know, the lovely thing, although we don't know what he wrote, it could have been something like, I mean, they were saying that the law says this, uh, and Jesus is writing something. Now, could he have said, was it a, a forgiveness thing he was writing down? Or was he writing down something judgmental? Whatever it was, the important thing is that the wind comes and blows it away. Isn't that lovely? The wind is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And it is there and whatever Jesus wrote, the wind comes and blows it away. And that is a lovely picture of what God has done for you and for me in Christ. The law has said that we should die. Okay? And it's just wonderful. I mean, when I was at school, like you, perhaps you were like me, did you ever revise? Not in your life, you know? A couple of days before and have a quick read, yeah, no problem. And then no wonder when you came out of the exam and all the brainy people said, God, that was really difficult. And all the sort of not so brainy, like me, said, God, that was easy. <laughs> and then when you get the results, I'm down here and they're up there. And you know, it's just as if Jesus is with you in the exam and he's taken the exam for you. Now, if only that could have been my case when I was taking these exams. Wouldn't it have been lovely to have had an expert there with you writing it for you? It would have been great. You'd have passed every time. But the trouble is I failed. Perhaps some of you did too. But in Christ and in our sin and in our humanity, Jesus took the test, didn't he? For you and for me, so that we didn't have to die. We didn't have to go through all that because Jesus went through it for us. And that is the lovely thing about God's messages for you and for me today. And I just want us to close our eyes just for a minute or so. And this could be a time where you can make a transaction with the Lord. Let's do business with him. And um, in view of the messages that we've just been looking at, hopefully some of it would have registered in your heart as something that we need to do or we need to change. So let's just be quiet for a minute or so. Thank you, Lord.